I want to welcome you as we gather in this beginning of Holy Week. As April and Justin both said, we, we start with that triumphal entry of Jesus into the city. And we want to ensure that we don't skip ahead to Easter, um, but, but we do pause. And we remember the path in between. A couple of things before we get into this. Um, in 2020, uh, we started something we've continued ever since, and, and this next week is a, a Easter, um, which I think is just a divine, <laughs> divine thing that God has done. Um, we started every quarter, once every fifth Sunday, uh, just allocating 100% of our offering to uh, various community ministries. And um, we're doing things a little bit different this year, but we, we've continued, we're going to continue doing this. And next week is our fifth Sunday, so it'd be our quarterly offering, and it just so happens to land on Easter, which I think is amazing. And one of the things that we've supported uh, ever since has been a mobile market program over in uh, East Kennewick, Eastgate Elementary. We have a big um, after-school program and a variety of things helping uh, families over there. And we put together a little promo, because um, I want to, I'm hoping that we can really, really knock the park out um, next week. Our entire offering on Easter will go to fund um, the mobile market program, hopefully for the, the whole annual year, um, which is actually $24,000. And so I wanna share this video. Uh, Jean Block, who has been our After School Matters um, um, coordinator for several years, uh, she and Trevor put this together for us. In May of 2020, during the height of the pandemic, many faced unemployment and uncertainty. Hillspring Church partnered with Second Harvest to provide groceries to those in need. As COVID subsided, we realized that food insecurity persisted. So we made a commitment to continue offering monthly food distributions. Today, as we look back, we celebrate 51 mobile market events. 51 mobile markets means that we've shared God's love with 13,000 families and distributed over half a million pounds of food. Now our goal is to fund mobile markets for the entire next year. Funding the next 12 months totals $24,000. That translates to nearly 100,000 meals to families in need. Together, we can share the love of God and bring hope to those in difficult times. I said I want to thank you for your continued support through this. Um, and up until now, we have divided among several different uh, groups every quarter offering. And what we're doing now is allocating 100% once a quarter to one thing. So this week, uh, next week, it'll be for the mobile market in um, June, 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 June. It'll be um, all for our Honduras ministry. Um, in the fall, we'll go to work with uh, scholarships for the kids over in Eastgate to, to be able to go participate in our youth programs. Um, some of them, like going to Montana, we all our kids go to Montana for camp. Uh, they just can't afford that. And then I'm really looking forward to our Christmas offering, which would be the uh, other fifth Sunday quarterly offering. 100% will go to, to Grace Clinic. But next week, I really want to ask you to, to join us as we support this ministry. Uh, the week after that, just kind of a little promo. Um, uh, we have a pretty big thing we're going to release 
the week after Easter, and many of you know we've been uh, putting together a capital campaign for a variety of things, but also including uh, addressing the elephant in the room here, which is our bathrooms. We just don't have enough restrooms in the, in the lobby. Um, I think we all know that. And so we are going to uh, redo the, the, the whole front, uh, and we'll talk about that. But we're going to start that campaign uh, the week after Easter. and just ask you to, to, to be in prayer for that. Um, and another thing I do want to ask, uh, that you be in prayer for um, Grimelda Sanchez, Pastor Grimelda, her husband Moses, um, his mother just passed away. And so we do want to lift up the Sanchez family. Uh, they're just so important in our, the life of our community, and we love them very much and ask your support for them at this time. Um, well, the last several weeks, we've been on a sermon series in prayer. We've been looking at several different figures in the Bible and what we can glean from uh, their prayer life and, and how we can help incorporate those things. And, and today, we're, we're kind of kind of finish that series um, uh, as we look at Mark chapter 14 and Jesus' prayer at the Garden of Gethsemane. But as I said, we're also beginning this journey toward the resurrection, toward Easter. And on Palm Passion Sunday, you begin singing Hosanna. Um, you know, we experience that triumphal entry into Jerusalem, the King of Kings entering the city of kings, the crowd waving their palms as the king enters. But the Bible says very quickly... Their cheers turned to chants as the, the same exact people within a week would yell, crucify him, crucify him. You can't experience a resurrection without a death. And it's so easy to go from celebrating Palm Sunday on, uh, you know, and waving the palms to, like I said, skipping to the resurrection. I want to walk through Mark chapter 14 uh, today. If you, if you have your Bibles, uh, just open them up to Mark 14. We're going to spend the morning through Mark 14 and, and, and really focus on what happens in between the waving of the palm branches toward that journey to the resurrection. You know, there isn't anywhere in the Gospels, uh, throughout the entire Gospel story, that, that gives us a better glimpse into Jesus' humanity than Mark 14. Also, there isn't anywhere in the Gospels that give us such a glimpse into the disciples' failure as Mark chapter 14. And that's where the pause. So Mark chapter 14, uh, it, it's not something, just on a historical level, it's not something the early church would have ever made up. What I mean, well, the leaders of a movement, especially the leaders of the early church in Mark in 14... They completely fail to the point that, that Mark stops calling them disciples in chapter 14 because they no longer deserve the title. When Jesus says, the hour has come, Mark 14, that means the hour of Jesus' arrest, but also the hour of Jesus' disciples' failure. The last time Mark will call them disciples is uh, chapter 14, verse 32. When they arrive in the Garden of Gethsemane. Mark says they went to a place called Gethsemane. And he said to his disciples. Sit here while I pray. And as I said, they won't be called disciples again until the story when the, the women arrive at the empty tomb in Mark 16 on Easter Sunday. Until then, Mark will call them just, just the twelve. Because they failed as disciples. I mean, not just Judas. We just jumped to Judas. But, you know, Peter, John, every one of them, all of them fail. Failure of the disciples is one of the main issues in Mark chapter 14. At the heart of this section is Jesus' faithfulness on one side, but the disciples' complete unfaithfulness on the other. The juxtaposition. And, and like I said, think about that from a historical perspective. No movement would ever make up a story about the highlighting the failure of its leaders as one of the pinnacle stories of the movement. But Mark 14 highlights the humanity of Jesus as well, more than anywhere else in the Gospels. 
Jesus is so very human in chapter 14. I mean, he's agitated. And there again, this is not something the early church would have ever made up. Listen to the story of the Garden of Gethsemane. They went to a place called Gethsemane. He said to his disciples, sit here while I pray. And he took with him Peter, James, and John and began to be distressed and agitated. And he said, I am deeply grieved even to death. Remain here. Keep awake. Going a little further, he threw himself on the ground. And he prayed, if it were possible, the hour might pass from him. He said, Abba, Father, for you all things are possible. Remove this cup, yet not what I want, but what you want. And he came and he found them sleeping. He said to Peter, Simon, are you still asleep? Couldn't you keep awake for one hour? Keep awake and pray that you may not come into the time of trial. The, the spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. And again, he went and he prayed, saying the same words. And once more he came and he found them sleeping. Their eyes were very heavy. They didn't know what to say. And he came a third time. And he said, are you still sleeping? Taking rest? Enough! The hour has come. The Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Get up. Let's be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. The hour has come. What do you do when the strong person in your life becomes weak. I mean, the person you lucked up to, the, the person that, you know, you've always been able to count on, and, and I'm sure we've all been in this at one point, you know, maybe you finally, you know, that point when you realize your parents are human. You know, when I was growing up, I, I was convinced as a little kid that when you became an adult, you didn't need to sleep and you didn't need to eat. Because, you know, every time I got up, my parents were already up. And, you know, growing up, they were always on diets. And so it was like they never ate, or at least they didn't have to. And I was really excited, you know, when I grew up that I wouldn't have to sleep or eat. And I was very disappointed when it didn't happen. <laughs> but I think so many of us, you know, we grow up, we think our parents are bulletproof. And then we hit an age and we realize that's not the case. Maybe it's your spouse. You know, you, you just... Something happens and you see their humanity and you're devastated. We all go through this. Maybe your older brother or your older sister or, you know, maybe it's your leader. Whatever. We're all human. Every one of us. We're going to fail. We're all going to fall short. We're all going to mess up. And we all have our fears, and we all have anxieties, and we all experience stress. And, you know, some of us, we just hide it better, but it'll come out eventually. And, and the thing I've really learned is the better a person is at hiding it, the more difficult it is for everyone else when that person's humanity hits. Because we're all human. How much more difficult would have been for the disciples at this point in the story when, when they see Jesus in Gethsemane he'd always been he'd always been leading he was always teaching them he was always guiding them and he always knew exactly what to say and exactly what to do but he just starts to fall apart in the garden and he warns them, it's all going to collapse. It's all, they're all going to scatter in fear. And there's, this is not something we honestly want to spend a lot of time with, usually. And, and it's almost embarrassing to watch this story unfold. It's embarrassing for the disciples. It's embarrassing for Jesus. 
his raw emotion on one side. And like I said, the, the just complete faithlessness of his followers on the other. But I'll tell you, if you can enter into this story, it will change your life. To, to really understand what's going on in this garden story, you have to look at the stories that surround it. Like I said, Mark 14. You know, right at the beginning, we have, we have the Last Supper. And then Jesus has this conversation with Peter where he tells him, you know, you're going to deny me three times before the morning comes. Then right after the garden, we, we go into the betrayal and the rest of Jesus. And, and you know, the, the Last Supper just highlights the failure of his disciples all over the place. Uh, you know. but, but in the midst of this, he still offers them a new covenant. Still offers them grace. Right after the Last Supper, like I said, you know, Jesus and Peter, they have this conversation. And, you know, you're going to deny me three times before the cock crows. Which leads us into the garden scene. And then Judas and his betrayal in a kiss. I mean, the garden scene is just sandwiched in between these stories that highlight the failure of his followers. And in the midst of it all, Jesus is just, he's overcome. With, with fear and anxiety and just horror of what's going to happen. And, and he prays that there be another way. He's already told his disciples what's going to happen. He's going to his death. He knows what's going to happen. But in the garden, he prays for a, a new possibility. And even when he is faithful to God's call, his disciples are unfaithful. And they betray him. Mark does something really fascinating in the Last Supper scene. And, and I don't want to take a lot of time, but, but I think it's important for us to hear. We need to listen to this part of the story. When it was evening, he came with the twelve. When they had taken their places and they were eating, Jesus said, Truly I tell you, one of you who will betray me, one who is eating with me. And Mark says, they began to be distressed. Say to him one after another, surely not I, Lord. And he said, it is one of the twelve. One who is dipping bread into the bowl with me. Like I said, you know, Mark just stops calling them disciples. He takes that honor away because they don't deserve it. He calls them the twelve. They're not going to be disciples until they're reconciled with Jesus after the resurrection. But the big deal here is Jesus says, one of them will betray. And, and every one of them, they respond with the same statement. Surely not I, Lord. Surely not I. Of course it's not me, right? They're all thinking the same thought is the point. What does he know? How could he know? Jesus says the one who dips his bread in the bowl with him is his betrayer. And that's something every single one of them do at that table that night. I mean, Mark doesn't name Judas here. They're all betrayers here. They've all lost the right to be disciples here. But Jesus overlooks that unfaithfulness. He overlooks their weakness. And in the midst of this communion, he offers them a new covenant, a new relationship. He says, while they were eating, he takes this loaf of bread. And after blessing it, he broke it. And he gave it to them. He said, take, eat, this is my body. And then he takes the cup. And after giving thanks, he gave it to them and said, drink from all of you. He said, this is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for many. He says, truly, I tell you, I will never again drink of the fruit of the vine until the day I drink it new in the kingdom of God. He offers them a new covenant, a new relationship. 
And right afterwards, Peter, like I said, he, he denies he would ever betray Jesus. And Jesus said, you will all become betrayers, deserters. It is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep will scatter. After I am raised, I'll go before you to Galilee. And Peter said, even though all become deserters, I will not. And Jesus says, truly I tell you this day, this very night before the cock crows twice, you will deny me three times. And he said vehemently, even though I must die with you, I will not deny you. And all of them said the same. And then they go to the garden to pray. And Jesus says to the twelve, I'm deeply grieved. Even to death. Remain and keep awake. In Greek, Jesus, uh, Mark says Jesus walks a micron, which is probably a yard or two. It's not very long is the deal. And he, he, just, he just throws himself on the ground. He prays, if this is at all possible, take this cup away from me, God. But not what I want, but what you want. You know, in, in Mark's gospel, God the Father audibly spoke with Jesus twice. Once at the beginning, at the baptism, Mark 1.11, a voice came from heaven. You are my son, the beloved, in whom I am well pleased. And then at the story of the Mount of Transfiguration in Mark 9, the, the cloud overshadowed. And from the cloud there came a voice. This is my son, the beloved. Listen to him. Can you imagine how much Jesus wanted to hear that voice in the garden that night? He's about to give his life for what he believes God wants him to do. And he prays for another way. But all he hears is silence. You know, be, be, I don't think Jesus wanted to die. He prayed to escape this. And God had spoke in the past. Where was the voice that night? Can you imagine Jesus' emotions in the midst of the silence? How alone he must have felt. And he looks at his followers just a yard or two away and they're sleeping. And he wakes them. And he just begs them to stay awake with him. And he says, pray that you don't come in the time of trial. And we know the story. The spirit's willing, but the flesh is weak. Jesus says, pray that you don't have to go through this because you aren't going to be able to do it. And he goes back to pray again. Same prayer, still met with silence. Nothing, nothing. God, where are you? I need to hear from you. And then he checks back on his friends, and they're asleep again. Can you imagine his, the, in his gut, the fear, the anxiety, but his personal struggle that he's alone and he goes back to prayer once more. Please take this cup away from me. I'm giving my life for these people. And, and they don't even care enough to stay awake for me. Just for one hour. My hour of need. There has to be another way, God. But not what I want, but what you want be done. And all he hears is silence. And then he goes back. And he finds up sleep again three times, you know, right before the garden. You know, Peter just said he'd never deny him. And then he denies him three times in the garden. But so do every one of those disciples. But then the betrayal moves to another level. Mark says in 1443, immediately while he was still speaking, Judas... One of the twelve arrived. With him there was a crowd with swords and clubs from the chief priests and the scribes and the elders. The betrayer had given him a sign. 
saying, the one I kiss is the man, arrest him and lead him away under guard. So he came, went to him at once, said, Rabbi, and kissed him. And they laid hands on him and they arrested him. One of those who stood near drew his sword and struck the slave of the high priest, cutting off his ear. And Jesus said, have you come out with swords and clubs to arrest me as if I was a bandit? Day after day, I was with you in the temple teaching. You did not arrest me. But let the scriptures be fulfilled. And all of them deserted and fled. The hour has come. The hour of Jesus' arrest. The hour of his disciples' failure. The hour of the twelve's betrayal. And the symbol was a kiss. And imagine Jesus' pain. And the swords and, 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 and clubs, they're a sign of betrayal. You know, he told them this would happen. Over and over, he told them, this is my path. This is God's will. And then when it happens, they not only, they don't recognize what God's doing at all, and they fight it with swords. I mean, they never listened to him. They never got it at all. Did anything he said ever take? I mean, the 12, they're the ones who are supposed to continue the journey after I'm gone. What's going to happen? Why am I dying? Why am I going through this? This was his last moment with the 12. And as he's been taken away, he is face to face with the reality that they just never got it. You know, disciples, they learn from their master. Disciples, they do what their leader does. And they're not disciples. And Jesus got to be thinking, what's this for nothing. He had talked with them over and over about this moment. He had asked them to pray with him as he prepared for this, and they never recognized God's work at all. I mean, rather than preparing for themselves to accept God's will, to have faith in God's will, they just slept through it. And, and, and Jesus' last view as he's been taken away, his last view of the disciples is just proof. They failed. They never got it. He's going to suffer. He's going to die. And they failed to understand that he was going to give his life for them. And the sword is just highlighting the fact that they, they, they fought God's will. They fought to recognize and to accept God's will. They're not going to follow him after this. They're not even following him while he's alive. How are they going to follow him when he's dead? How will they carry on my ministry God, are you there? I can't imagine a lower point for Jesus than this moment. Was it all for nothing? Jesus showed them the way to meet death faithfully. But they didn't follow him. While he's giving his life, can you imagine his emotions, his death was just the final complete moment of a dedicated life. Living for God, regardless. And his followers, they just, they just they fought and they ran. You know, I really sat with this passage this week. I just thought about what does this mean for us today in 2024? I don't think Jesus was afraid of death. I don't think he wanted to die at all. But I think he was prepared to die. 
And I think the fact that his disciples betrayed him at his time of need, I think that really hurt. Really hurt. But I don't even think that's the main issue in this passage. Uh, that's not the heart of this prayer, not my will but thine be done. I think the, the thing I really think was the greatest blow for Jesus at this moment was the fact that there was no answer, no voice from God in the garden that night. The silence was deafening. Not even a, no, Jesus, this is, this is what has to happen. This is your path. You have to say, you know, I, I don't think the fear of death was the most difficult issue. I'm sure it was an issue. Of course. An abandonment of friends, that's, that's horrible. But I think his fi- primary fear was just abandonment by God. His request to God to remove the cup, it hinged on God's will being done, not Jesus' will. And I think he just wanted some assurance, right? I'll do this, but if I'm going to give my life, God, I, I really need to know, are you there? Are you with me? God, just give me a sign, anything. But he got nothing. But he still followed God's will. You know, if Jesus received nothing from God at this point, no affirmation, just silence, when he prayed in the hour of his greatest need, and I'm sure this was the most heartfelt prayer he's ever given, should we be surprised when we don't get the answers that we want? Or even more when all we hear is silence. I think this is going to happen to every one of us at some point in our lives. You know, the ancient Christians, they called this the dark night of the soul. And and you have heard God's voice in the past. You have felt so close to God. And, And then when your cross is set and you pray as hard as you can, you don't feel God's presence. At all. And and this is a time of trial. This is a time when the hour has come for us. What will our story be? Will we follow Jesus? I mean, the disciples, they lost their title at this point. They were restored as disciples by the risen Christ. But the reason they're able to be restored is because Jesus chose to continue his journey even in the midst of silence. Those who follow Jesus as Lord, they will find themselves at this place. They will find themselves in a metaphorical garden. And and they will be tired and it will be so easy to just lay down and take a nap. Do we keep following Jesus or do we lose the title of disciple? Jesus is very clear. Every one of us, he says, will have a cross. And it's going to look different for every one of us. But I think it will mean having faith God is present even in the midst of silence. When we're praying, but we're not hearing. Hebrews 11.1, faith is the assurance of things hoped for. The conviction of things not seen. You know, faith, faith is belief. It's an affirmation that God is present even when you don't feel it. Even when you don't hear it, you keep going. Faith is looking on a hill, on a lonely cross, and seeing centurions gathering all around you and hearing crowds saying, crucify him, crucify him, and you continue down the path. What does that mean in your life? Will you follow Christ? You have to realize, he experienced his resurrection Because he experienced the death. Without the cross, Jesus never would have been raised from the dead. We want to go from waving palm branches on Palm Sunday. We want to go straight to Easter. It doesn't work that way, right? Every one of us, we're going to be met with this type of moment. And and we're going to hear these words 
well done, good and faithful servant, we are first going to have to do what the disciples failed to do. We're going to have to keep following. Even when it means we take up a cross. Maybe it means we stand up for what we know is right. And you stick your net. What is the cost you're paying right now for your discipleship? Are you willing to pay? You know, when we are called to feed the hungry, it means we probably are going to have to go without if we're really going to answer God's call. Or at the very least, we've we, we got to stop hoarding everything for ourselves if we want to follow. Or maybe it's about time. You know, sometimes we're called to give our time and it would just be so much easier to write a check because that's inconvenient. Sometimes we don't get the appreciation that we really deserve. Does that mean we stop? Maybe taking up a cross, following Jesus, means there's an ethical decision at work. Maybe a decision you know is not going to be popular with your friends. What do you do? Maybe for you it means coming to terms with an addiction. Well, you know, one of the most difficult things I think for anybody when you talk about overcoming fear is overcoming a fear of embarrassment when you know you need help and asking. It's hard to make a call and speak to someone about weakness, but you'll never experience resurrection without first experience of death. Maybe it means dealing with anxiety. You know, that's a huge issue in our world. Just sending your kid off to school, I, my gosh, that's huge. Maybe it's dealing with a financial mess that you've created. And, and, and one of the hardest things, you know, for people is just to stop digging, I found. <laughs> Maybe that prayer in the garden for you has to deal with a health issue. And you pray and you pray, maybe for yourself, maybe for a loved one, a friend. And you're walking in faith. And you just want to feel God's presence and an affirmation because you need assurance. And maybe you're lonely. Maybe for the first time you're really realizing discipleship needs to cost something. Are we going to be like the disciples and we want the benefit of the cross, but we want the burden of the, the, the cost, the change in life patterns? You know, grace is free, but don't ever, ever confuse that with grace being cheap. It's so costly. Jesus paid the ultimate price for grace. On the cross. And disciples are people who follow their leaders. And, and they go where the leader goes. They do what their leader does. Mark 8, 34. He called the crowds with his disciples. And he said, if anyone wants to become my follower, let them deny themselves, take up their cross, and follow. Those who want to save their life will lose it. And those who lose their life for my sake, for the sake of the gospel, will save it. The disciples, they, they, they completely failed here what is your discipleship costing you what does taking up a cross mean for you today will you follow jesus even in the midst of silence Lord, we thank you for this holy week, the journey of following Jesus. Not just when the crowds sing Hosanna, but what do we do with the crowds, the same people, when they yell crucify? as we look toward new life and resurrection.
Help us to understand the event that precedes is a death. Help us to follow. In your son's name we pray. Amen.